Well, good morning. Good to see you. Welcome to Mercy View. My name is Brad, one of the pastors here. And uh, if you're joining us for the first time this morning, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. We're honored that you've chosen to worship with us uh, this morning. Well, one of uh, Holly and I's favorite pastimes, uh, and probably a little bit more of Holly's, this is just she's rubbed off on me uh, on this, is um, all things British monarchy. in fact, last night, of all things, we found ourselves watching, um, uh, it's a documentary kind of thing and, and, and has different episodes, and we were watching the episode on, it, the, the, the documentary is called The Story of London, and the second episode was about the royal monarchy there in uh, Britain. And um, I think that uh, we watched them uh, because, honestly, like what we're witnessing when we see all of the pomp and circumstance of what's happening there, it, it is so foreign to our experience here in the States, right? Um, one of the things that has always been so interesting about all of that is, is, is that the, there is a sovereign who exercises authority in appointing a prime minister there. That is so different than what we do here in America, right? Like, how would you feel if, if there was one royal family choosing our president every four years and you had no say in that? That's, that would be probably hard for us. We're, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, that, that would kind of go against our sensibilities here in America. But I wonder if we aren't um, thinking as clearly about that as maybe we should. And here, here's what I mean by that. Though we may look in, at that and go, man, that is so different than what we do. That is so foreign. Uh, it is when you kind of think of it in, re- in the realm of like maybe politics or in the realm of like leadership. But here in America, you know, we, we don't necessarily have a king, but we appoint people Maybe it's athletes, or it's those that are very wealthy, or maybe it's media stars or social influencers. We do a very similar thing with those people. We make them king-like figures in our culture, and for even us, in our hearts. Why is it in a place like America, where we have no king, we still create kings? We have something in us that desires to crown something. That's my contention. And I I wonder why we feel the need to do that. Why do we feel the need to crown someone or something in our lives? There is something about kings or kingship. What is it, though? Is there really a need that you and I have for A king, do you really need a king? This morning we begin a new sermon series today in the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is an Old Testament historical narrative. It's towards the front of your Bible if you're new to the Christian faith. And this series we are calling In Search of a King. I'm so excited to jump into this Old Testament book with you because um, it is it is a, a uh, this is so true of all the books and it always feels like this every time no matter what the Lord providentially brings us to it could not be more relevant for us uh, you're going to find that uh, in the days to come and and I mentioned this last week we're going to be in the book of First Samuel for for about a year we'll take some breaks uh, in and through this series but. Uh, um, we're really excited about jumping into this. In fact, uh, whenever the book of, of Samuel was written, it was actually written as one complete book. Um, it was whenever people started translating the Bible, and for, for a variety of reasons, they split up the book into two parts, called it First and Second Samuel. But it's really one continuous story. And because of that, actually, when we're done with First Samuel, the plan is to move right into Second Samuel towards the end of next year. But you're going to see this um, in First and Second Samuel. Um, we find the story really of three characters, three people. Uh, obviously, Samuel is the first one. Um, we we also have Saul, and then David. 
And when I was praying and thinking through what we should be doing in, in our sermon schedule at this part of this year, one of the things that came to my mind was the, 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 the person of David. David is that figure in the Bible that many of us, if you've been in the church for a while, have had a lot of interaction with. Now, a lot of our interaction has come from a different place, though, in the Bible. Not necessarily First and Second Samuel, but the Psalms, right? And you will see this in your Bibles, like where uh, they put titles and things uh, above the Psalms. You know, if it's written by David, it'll say that, right? And we see a lot of interesting things happen in the book of Psalms as it relates to the person of David. And if you're like me, I, I sometimes read the Psalms and kind of wonder, like, what's going on here? Especially those Psalms where David seems to be running away from something, right? Hiding calling out to the Lord to defeat his enemies, like in very uh, violent ways. Like, what's going on there? Well, we're going to get a lot of those answers as we look at First Samuel. Second Samuel uh, is actually exclusively about the story of David. And so this is going to be, I think, really helpful for us in light of, of that as well. But here's what I want to do this morning. I actually want to just sort of ease in get a 30,000 foot view of what's happening in the book of 1 Samuel so that we can have kind of a framework or a grid to, to better understand the book as we move forward. Because though there's, there is a structure to the book, there's themes in the book, there's characters in the book, most of all what God wants to do in this book with us is to point us to a holy God, a redeeming Jesus, and a sanctifying spirit. I believe God desires to do something in our hearts through this series, but also believe that God desires to do something to us and, and for us as a body as well. This book is written not just to individuals. This book, I think, is intended to be uh, understood as a, a people of God and how he wants us to honor him. And so today is going to be a little bit of a mix of teaching and preaching, a little bit of the classroom, a little bit of the pulpit. Uh, so uh, bear with me in that. But just uh, as we get into our uh, overview this morning, I want to invite you to see three things. The first is this. We need to acknowledge God as king. We need to acknowledge God as king. Second, we need to receive God as king. And third, we need to please God as king. So let's start here this morning. The author of the book of 1 Samuel should be obvious, but let me just say something first. If the Bible is the revelation of God to us, to mankind, and it contains the story of God's redemption that is available to all of us, I think it matters greatly that it is written by real people grounded in history that were inspired by the Spirit to write that revelation of God to man. In other words, if it's not that, if we're merely reading a book that makes claims about God, that makes claims on us, but we don't know if it's really true. We don't know if it's really grounded in history. Why would we give our lives to that claim on us? Well, praise God that through centuries of confirmation from historians and scholars and even archaeologists, we can know that we know that the Bible that we hold in our hands has proven to be more historically and archaeologically accurate than any other ancient book ever written. And, and by the way, the Bible of all historical books it has been the most like stringent scientific textual analysis as, as it's been put to the test more than any other book. And after all of that, it has been proven to be authentic in every way. And First Samuel, the book of First Samuel, as a part of the Bible, is no exception to that. Now, we know that Samuel wrote a book. If you go forward in this, this book in 1 Samuel 10, it, it has language that, that, that shows us that somehow Samuel wrote a book. It doesn't say that he necessarily wrote this book, like with his own hands. 
It's very possible that he wrote part of this book, but most historians believe that Samuel likely worked with a couple of other men to write this book named Nathan and Gad. And Nathan and Gad, if you go to first and second, uh, excuse me, first Chronicles 29, it seems to speak to this idea. So, so it, it may have been that Samuel didn't necessarily with his own hand write the books of first and second Samuel himself, but most scholars believe that at a minimum he supplied the information for both of these books. Now, the context that, that 1 Samuel is being written in, um, in the scriptures, is, uh, again, I said this earlier, it's, we got to remember this, the genre of this book, it is, it's what's called a historical narrative. And what that means is that it's a story told by a narrator through the eyes of God himself. And, and you heard uh, Ellen read 1 Samuel 1, 1 and 2, and it, it gives us a little bit of insight of what's happening here at the very beginning of, of, of the book of, of, of 1 Samuel. And, and in particular, what you're going to want to notice today, because we're going to see this story continue next week, is that there is a barren woman named Hannah. And Hannah would go on, and we'll see again this in the weeks to come, she's going to give birth uh, God is going to open her womb, and she's going to give birth to Samuel. Now, the events of 1 Samuel from that point forward uh, span about 100 years. Um, this is o- over a 1,000 years before Jesus is born. And the events of 2 Samuel, we'll get into this again next year, cover another about 40 years. Now, at the time of 1 Samuel, Israel had not heard from God in decades. God had been silent. The priests were corrupt. We're going to see this next week. We're going to be introduced to a high priest by the name of of Eli. He is a a, a priest and judge of Israel at the time, and and even he is not faithfully serving God at this time that we come into 1 Samuel. The worship of, of God at this time is idolatrous. The nearby nations around Israel are threatening their safety. This is not a, a, a time of great joy and, and worship of God. It is a very silent and dark moment in the history of God's people. Theologian and pastor Peter Lightheart says, this, says it this way, The lamp was still burning, but only dimly. And the woman, Hannah, was barren. The worship system described in Exodus and Leviticus was simply not operating, Lightheart says. So as we enter into the story of 1 Samuel, the people of God are in a bad spot. They need to hear from God again, and they need to fear God again. They need to worship God rightly with their lives And live lives that honor God and and bring glory to Him. And so God, as He always does, takes the initiative and begins to bring about change for the sake of His people. By the way, without that, this is true in our lives spiritually, right? We would continue in our disobedience, continue in our dishonor. But but God takes the initiative, we're going to see this in this book... And it, it brings about a change in the hearts of God's people. Here's Lightheart again. He says, But with the dark age descending, Yahweh intervened to open the womb, to trim the wick, and to create, as he always does, listen, a future. In the early days of Samuel, we're going to see this, Yahweh tears apart the tabernacle. But he doesn't do it to just sort of like, Say, I'm done with you, you're not worshiping me, I'm moving on to another people group. He does it so that he can actually give his people a future. He desires to rebuild. And the way God does this is by first giving them one final judge and prophet, a man named Samuel. Now don't miss that word prophet. Remember, God has been silent For decades, one of the ways that God says, I'm going to intervene here, I'm going to pursue you as my people because I love you, is I'm going to send you someone who will speak for me. You will hear me again. 
And so Samuel is the first character in our, uh, in our book that we're going to see his story play out. And as, as Samuel gets older, the people of Israel start to get restless. Um, Samuel's sons are not faithful. And the, the people of God are, are starting to feel that pressure coming in from outside. Other countries are, are, are starting to put pressure on them. And, and uh, the people of, of Israel wanted to defend themselves. And they looked at the other countries around them and saw that those countries had kings. And those kings were leading armies. And those were the armies that were threatening God's people. And so... The people of God, Israel, said to Samuel, we need a king. And so God gave them a king. God gave them Saul. And that is the second character. We're going to talk a little bit more about these guys here in just a moment. Then David um, in 1 Samuel. And much of 1 Samuel records the history of Israel in the land of Canaan as they move from the rule of Judges to a unified nation under a king. The people of God are being transformed from a loosely affiliated group of tribes in this story into an integrated and interconnected nation under a form of government that would first be headed by King Saul, and then, as we see much of 1 Samuel Chronicle and all of 2 Samuel Chronicle, King David. Now, within this transition from a priestly covenant to a royal covenant, the main story has to do with what Lightheart calls the crossing fates of Saul and David. Those are really the two main characters in our story. Saul's rise and fall is like an expanded retelling story of Adam. And if Saul was like the first Adam, David was a type of the last Adam, called to replace the fallen king as the head of God's people. So in short, what 1 and 2 Samuel highlights is this decisive reality of leadership. 1 and 2 Samuel pays particular attention to the failure of Israel's leaders to raise up other leaders who will faithfully lead God's people. And that pattern highlights a a key failure of Israel's leaders during this early monarchy. Now, I said earlier there are really three characters in this book that are prominent. Samuel, the last judge and first prophet. Saul, the first king of Israel. And David, the king-elect, who is in 1 Samuel anointed but not yet recognized as Saul's successor. That happens in 2 Samuel. So let's talk about each of these uh, men. These are um, such prominent uh, individuals in our book. It's really, I think, helpful to get a grasp on who they are, what, what part they play in this book. Samuel's the first one I want to talk about. His name means name of God. And actually, the psalmist who penned Psalm 99 ranks Samuel with Moses and Aaron as one who called upon the Lord's name. In other words, Samuel was a faithful man. He, he depended upon the Lord. Um, Samuel is actually one of eight people in the Bible that God himself calls by name twice. That's significant. In the book of Acts, Peter considers Samuel to be the first of the prophets after Moses. And as far as we can tell, we're going to see this in our, 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 our book here, he led an order of prophets. He was a prophet of prophets. And his prophetic ministry is actually very significant because, again, it begins at a time when words from the Lord were basically, he was silent. And so we see with Samuel, um, prophetic revelation starts to happen again. And uh, many believe that what we see recorded in the prophetic books in the Bible started in this period because the Lord started to speak again. Now, Samuel also served as a judge, and this is one of the, we'll talk more about this in in, in our series, but um, the judge in the Old Testament has got some similarities or some overlap to the way we would think about a judge in our time, but there are also some differences, And, and Samuel was really the last judge, actually, before this era of kingship or monarchy began, and you 
there's a couple of chapters in 1 Samuel where we're going to see this in particular, 1 Samuel 7 and 12. In both of those chapters, Samuel speaks the word of the Lord to the people to warn them that the hand of the Lord will be against them and their king if they refuse to fear him and to serve him and obey him. So uh, Samuel, part of his role in this book is to bring a, a loving but truthful word to God's people. But Samuel also seems to be engaged in priestly activities in our book as well. Now, it's unclear whether Samuel was officially a priest or not. Most people believe that he wasn't, but that he did serve in some capacities in a priestly way. You're going to see this in his story. He was brought up in the temple by Eli, and so he, he, he did probably conduct priestly services alongside Eli and Eli's sons. And there are places we're going to point that out as we move forward. But there are a couple other really interesting things about Samuel that you're going to see in our, our book. Samuel was a Nazarite. Uh, do you know who the most famous Nazarite in the Bible was? Samson, I heard. Yeah. Samson is probably the most well-known Nazarite. Samuel was too. So he's probably number two on the list. Um, and as a side note, the book of Judges and 1 Samuel overlap in a lot of ways, like time-wise. Many believe that Samson succeeded Eli as judge and preceded uh, Samuel as judge. Um, in other words, they think he was the link between those two men. But as a Nazarite, like Samson, Samuel was dedicated to the Lord as a child. That's coming, by the way, I think next week or in a couple weeks. And when that kind of dedication was made, it was made for life. And as a part of the Nazarite vow, if you know the story of Samson, it would have been true for Samuel as well. It would have meant that Samuel would have never cut his hair either. But maybe the most fascinating story about Samuel comes in 1 Samuel 28. This is towards the end of the book. After Samuel dies, King Saul meets with the, just hang with me here, the witch of Endor. This is in there. And this witch conjures up, listen, the spirit of Samuel. In all of, of this book, though, we primarily going to see the stories of Saul and David. Samuel has quite a character arc in this book, right? We see him as a baby. We see him grow up to be a national leader, and then we see him as a ghost. Wait till you get to 1 Samuel 28, all right? Now, next is Saul. The name Saul means asked, which makes sense because this is the first king that God gave to his people. Saul came from a wealthy family. We see this in 1 Samuel 9. He was tall, dark, and handsome. Um, and because of the constant threat of war and desire to be like the surrounding nations, God's people demanded a king, and this is the one that God gave them first. He was the first choice to give to God's people to lead the scattered nation uh, of Israel. But you're going to see in his story that Saul, he started out good, but he quickly became foolish and selfish and ultimately a coward. He ignored the word of God. He craved the approval of men. He disobeyed God at several key moments, overstepped his duties, put the people of God at odds with each other by not keeping the law and not directing them to live for God. And ultimately, God stops speaking to Saul. Saul was a failed leader. We're going to see that in our story. Yet God used this failure to discipline his people and call them to renew their trust in him. But last is David. The name David means beloved. And again, much of 1 Samuel and all of 2 Samuel centers on the story of David. In fact, when a psalm interfaces with a passage from 1 and 2 Samuel, we're going to reference that to give you guys a connection point there. I think that'll be helpful. But if you know the story of David, David was a, a, a warrior, a skilled warrior. He was a musician. He was a leader of men. He was a man who trusted God and encouraged his countrymen to act like God's people. And probably the most famous story of David is, is, is found in these, this, the book of, of Samuel, and, and, and it's his defeat of Goliath, right? David becomes, after this, a celebrated and, and uh, respected figure in all of Israel, and it actually makes Saul 
so furious and jealous, fears that David is going to seize his kingdom, and, and uh, we see that story play itself out in these, these books. And ultimately, Saul does get swept away by his own rebellion and actually never stops pursuing David to try to kill him. And even when Saul eventually dies, what's amazing is that David mourns for Saul, the one who was chasing him, wanted him dead. And even though David himself knew that he was God's anointed, David did not force his way to the throne. You're going to see that too in our story. He respected God's sovereignty. He honored the authorities that God had currently in place, trusting that God and his time would fulfill what his will was for David. And sure enough, God gives the people another king in David as Saul's successor. David is believed to have been about 12 to 16 years old when he was anointed king of Israel. He was the youngest of Jesse's sons and a very unlikely choice for king, humanly speaking. And really the purpose of the books of First and Second Samuel is to tell the story of the establishment of the kingship covenant with David. When you read these two books together, the authors give an unbelievable amount of effort to preserve the fact that David is the true Deuteronomy 17 king for Israel. David is shown to be God's legitimate choice for the throne through which a new covenant will be established, the Davidic covenant. David was the founder then of this dynasty that would rule in Jerusalem for over 350 years. Now, I want to spend some time just briefly talking about three themes of 1 Samuel that we're going to see as prominent um, in our, our series. And I'm going to do that by just looking at some of these passages that we uh, heard, a couple others that, that we haven't read yet. But the first one is the one that you heard Ellen read from 1 Samuel I'm not going to read that again, but as you heard in that, this is the moment in 1 Samuel where God's people are demanding a king. Now, in many ways, this is the climax of the book of 1 Samuel. We've talked about this a little bit already, but at this point in Israel's story, the people had rejected God as their king. And though the Lord was displeased with Israel's request for a king, which is an interesting, we'll, we'll be talking about that as we get to this. God wasn't really happy about this. He tells Samuel to give the people what they ask for. Samuel's message is this. You want a king like the nations? You will get a king like the nations. And how often do we make similar claims on God? How, how often do we as Christians ignore God's word to us? We ignore the, the principles of God's word so that we can have what the world has to offer. And then when it leads to defeat or bondage or captivity, we wonder why our request wasn't met. Right? Well, we, we were asking for the wrong thing. One of the themes of this book is that we need to embrace God's rule in our life. His kingship is good, and it's right for us. And when we willingly and humbly submit ourselves to his rule, we will find that it brings flourishing. It brings thriving to us as a Christian. That's the first thing that I want to invite you to see this morning. We need to acknowledge God as king. That's one of the lessons, one of the things we're going to draw out in this series Rather than living as our own authorities, we need to acknowledge God as king. Now, the second passage I want to look at is, is 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14. Here's what it says. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord that he gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of the people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Can you guess who's talking to who here? Yeah. In the, this passage, King Saul is waiting for Samuel. While he's waiting, the people are growing restless and beginning to leave. And as the situation unravels, Saul takes it upon himself to do something that he's not been called to do. And this is right before this. But he, he begins to initiate a sacrifice. Now, as noble as that may sound, 
That is not the role of a king. It's the role of a priest. Saul was not a priest. He was a king. But he was actually doing something in this moment that you and I do. He was seeking the approval of man. And it actually led to his eventual downfall. These verses are Samuel's response to Saul's approval-seeking actions. Basically, Samuel is saying to Saul here, you're not going to be able to continue on, Saul, like this. Your lineage will not stay in the king's throne. You are going to be stepping away, and God is going to bring somebody from a different family to rule this land. I would think the most cutting thing for Saul to hear would be that phrase, a man after God's own heart. Because here's what that means. Samuel is saying, Saul, you do not have God's best interests here. You're not pursuing God. You're pursuing the pleasing smile of man. One of the greatest idols of our time is the approval of others. Woven into our humanity is this quest for approval. A child seeks the approval of their parents. The inverse happens a lot too. A parent seeks the validation of their child. A teenager yearns for the acceptance of their peers. The employee looks for the backing of his coworkers and his boss. And even sometimes in the name of, of missional respectability, a Christian can look for approval from the wider culture. Saul is the living embodiment of what happens when anyone gives in to that longing to be approved by others. This is the second thing I want to invite you to see this morning. We need to receive God as king. Not pursue the smile of man, but the smile of God. In order to receive that, we, or in order to pursue the smile of God, we need to receive God as king. The last passage I want to look at is found in 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. Here's what it says. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much, in, as, much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You probably heard this, this verse before. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft. And arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, you have, you have been rejected as king. This is Samuel again saying, it is not just that you haven't sought God, but you've sought answers in the wrong places. Samuel is pointing out how in, in our desperation to get answers to our prayers, to get answers to our hopes, to our dreams, even to make sense of our suffering, we can easily turn to the wrong things. When we reject God's word and try to seek something else that will make us happier, we will find that we are turning away from the very thing that gives light and life to us. And Samuel says... It's actually through obedience that we please God. Now again, we have a, a, a misconception about obedience many times is that somehow that is God's way to turn the screws on us, to take joy out of our life, to make us these sort of dour and somber Christians, just sort of like zombies, you know, walking around like we, we have no happiness whatsoever. But again, the, the call of God on our lives to live lives that are holy, to obey him, is, is God's way of bringing that very thing to us. Freedom, joy, hope, peace. When Samuel says that to obey is better than sacrifice, to heed or to please God is found by turning to him and not other sources of truth, he's reminding us of where light and life come from. To not do it is to be arrogant, to think of ourselves as a better authority, to think of ourselves as knowing what is best. In Saul, what we see is someone who had developed a low opinion of God's commands and a high opinion of himself. Friends, that's us. How often is our opinion of God way lower than our own opinion of ourselves? 
And even when confronted with his wrongdoing, Saul didn't repent, ask God to forgive him. He, he actually attempted to vindicate himself, to justify his wrong actions. And that's when God rejected him. This is the last thing I want to invite you to see this morning. We need to please God as king, not ourselves or others. I want to close here briefly. Just at the bottom of this series, what is woven through the themes that we just talked about is this. How the kingship of God brings flourishing to the people of God. How the kingship of God brings flourishing to the people of God. We're going to see two sides of the same coin. And one is how, uh, how the kingship or, or, or uh, failed kingship, failed leadership does not bring flourishing to the people of God. And we're going to see in the life of David uh, how a righteous king brings flourishing to his people. You heard um, Jacob say this earlier. The people of God actually did not need a king. They already had one. It was God himself. But they asked for a king, and God gave them initially the king that they deserved in Saul. A king that in the end looked and acted like the kings of the nations around them. So God, because of his grace, he, he provides another king, King David, who would protect and provide for his people. In other words, David, though imperfect, and we're going to see imperfections in the life of David, he is not a king like the kings of the nations around Israel. But even in the kingship of David in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, it's meant to point us to something else. It's meant to point us to another king, King Jesus. And in the New Testament, Jesus is seen as the true Israel, redeeming Israel's history in his own history. The idea that Israel was embodied in the person of Jesus is actually introduced to us in the book of 1 Samuel. Through the type of David, David as a type. David foreshadows Jesus by his patience in the face of persecution. In his sufferings on the way to receiving his kingdom. In his kindness to Saul's house. In his victories over Israel's enemies. Over his intention to build a house for the Lord. In his exile from Jerusalem during the rebellion of Absalom, among others. David points us to the true and better king, King Jesus. And, and how we get from here in 1 Samuel to there, the true and better king, King Jesus, is really the main message of 1 and 2 Samuel. We will be challenged to acknowledge and receive and please King Jesus and challenged to live as faithful citizens of the kingdom of Jesus in this series. Because it is there, it is in our king, that we find true hope, true peace, and true joy. Friends, that's where we're headed. Would you join us on that journey? Let's pray together.